Okay, so welcome everybody to the Mike, J Michael J. Edwards Class of 1983 Retail and Merchandising Leadership Series. We are celebrating five years of our program. I am so happy to have you here this evening. Um, and we are very fortunate um, in the Masters of Retail and Merchandising at Drexel University for a very lovely gift from Mike Edwards that sponsored this speaker series. Tonight's guest is one of my favorite people I think I have <laughs> ever met as an alum of Drexel, just in passing. And she is fantastic. Nancy Mayer is a 30 year veteran in retail and mer retail merchandising. The entirety of her career has been based in off price retailing. She started her career as a co-op at Drexel as an assistant buyer in the ladies apparel at Burlington Coat Factory and returned after graduation to enjoy 26 years. Ultimately leaving as the senior vice president and the general merchandise manager of Burlington Coat Factory at Burlington at the time to start her own consulting practice in off price retail management she is currently a big wig. She is currently the senior vice president of merchandising at Nordstrom's Rack, and she is helping them change and build that organization. And Nancy, welcome for, and thank you so much for doing this with us this evening. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, can you tell us a little bit, I kind of read a little bit about your background. Can you kind of give us the, 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 full, the full enchilada about your background and talk about you know, your studies at Drexel a little bit and how Drexel helped you in your career and just give us an overview of, of, of your life at Drexel University and co-op. I would love to. So you've heard this story, Joe, and I, and it's, it's part of me. So I will say it again, but when I was growing up, I always loved fashion and retail. And my first real job, I worked from, you know, I was always designing things, creating things, but my first real job was working in retail at a store called Annie Says, if anyone on the call remembers it. But it was basically an off-price retailer as well. Um, and I got to merchandise the racks, I got to colorize the racks, and it was just great fun talking to customers and driving sales and just being very creative. And I never thought I could do that as a career. So when I left, when I graduated high school and I went to Drexel, my major was actually nutrition because I thought that my, what I was gonna end up doing was live a healthy lifestyle, which really hasn't happened, and write a really amazing diet book. And that was really my dream while I thought retail was a side hustle, basically. And the first day that I met my college roommate, she was a fashion design and merchandising major. And I said to her, I said, what is that? And she explained it to me and I said, oh my God, that is exactly what I want to do in life. I never knew you could go to college for that. I never knew there was a career for that. I thought you could just work in stores, go back and forth through corporate. I didn't even know what it was all about. So I literally changed my major day one to the fashion dive Nesbitt as it was previously called Nesbitt. Is it still called Nesbitt? I'm not sure. But um, I changed my major the first day and I became I was very proud of becoming a design and merchandising major, but what I was always really good at, even though I had a creative side, I was always good at math, science, that kind of thing. So I never you know, thought I could go into fashion design because I didn't have that, I, I didn't lean that direction. But what merchandising is, it's right smack in the, in the intersection of art and science. You're able to lean on that art piece of it, which is the fun piece, but where I found that I was really good at it was driving business, math problems, leadership, all those things. So my four years of Drexel, I was so thrilled to be able to even take art classes, which I'd never, I'd never done that before. Um, I took merchandising classes. I took art of history classes, but where I really excelled was, was, was um, math. So when um, co-op offered, one of the reasons why I went to Drexel in the first place was because number one, they required an Apple Macintosh, I think at the time, like yeah. way, way back when. It was like the one and only school that required a computer, which I thought was really, really forward. And second, they, you were required to do co-ops. And yeah. I thought that was so wonderful because you just don't know what you want to do in life. And I think that you, co-op is a great thing to do when you really don't know what you want to do. So my first co-op was with uh, Kids R Us at the time, which was a now defunct arm of Toys R Us, but the Kids R Us version was all the apparel for kids. 
and I was a department manager at Kids R Us. And again, I love that whole creative part of it, but I just didn't feel I was, I was my, my math side was kind of weakening. I was building leadership skills and creativity, but I really missed that science and math type of thing. So my second option, my second year I did uh, as an assistant buyer at Burlington Co. Factory. And I was so fortunate to be able to work for the owner as, as basically helping one of his buyers. So because I was able to get in there the first day, and hopefully no one's on the call that will ever remember this, and I'm sure they won't. They actually assigned me to a buyer that my very first day when I met her and I said, I went into his office. I, 19 years old or 20 years old, knocked on the door of the owner of Burlington Code Factory. And I said, listen, I really appreciate the opportunity that you're giving me, but I really feel that I'm going to learn so much more working directly for you than I'm going to work for this buyer. Not to mention she's an idiot, but I didn't say that to him. I was just looking at it from my perspective. If I could work for the owner, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I shoot for the stars? So because of that, he really looked at me and he's like, wow, she really, really cares about her career. She's smart. So I was able to work directly for him. And on day two, he said, you know what? You can come back and work for me full time after graduation. 26 years later. Well, he saw something in you. Yes, he did. For sure. For sure. And it's, and, and whether it's because you're smart or it's really the passion. I mean, by day two, I just knew that this was it for me. I just knew it. How did your career progress? Like how long were you an assistant buyer? Do you remember that? And how long, and then what were the steps and what, what positions did you hold at Burlington? Okay. So again, back then I'm going back in time where you had companies like Macy's and Bloomingdale's that had very rigid um, buyer training organizations. It kind of took you five years to go through a training program. You had to go into planning. You had to do stores. You had to do really widened your horizons to be able to get promoted within these other department stores. Yep. But when it came to off price in Burlington, I had the owner. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to promote you. And I said, okay. So he hired me back when I came back for, from graduation and I got my first job as an assistant buyer with one of the smartest buyers there. And I just, it, I just caught on. I just knew it. He tapped me on my shoulder. He said, you're ready to be a buyer after four months. I didn't, this is the wow. first time, that was the first time I didn't ask for, for a position. And I'll go into that in a little bit. But he tapped me on the shoulder. He said, you're ready to be a buyer. I became a buyer within four months. Within a year, I kept getting more responsibility. So I bought lingerie and then the handbag buyer left. So I took on handbags and then I was doing so well there. Then I started doing women's suits. And then it just so happened, I was buying like 10 categories. And it was something different every day. It was fun. You could actually be in the market. We were in the market two days every week in New York City. We'd buy product right out of the market. We'd get it packed up and sent directly to stores. And within one week, you basically got your report card. Did it sell or did it not sell? So we were able to react so, so quickly. And then after I was doing that for a period of time and became a senior buyer and started training other buyers, then I became, after 10 years of that, I became a vice president and um, I was a vice president for about five or six years. And then through changes at the company, I was um, elevated to a senior vice president, GMM. Let me, and, let me ask you a question. Do you remember how many stores they had when you started versus how many stores they had when you left? Yeah. So when I started, it was about 150 stores. And when I left, it was close to 700. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, so you were, you were part of the growth spurt. Definitely. Definitely. And what, what made you, so you, you had this career there for so long and it, and it, and you were, you were a vice president. What made you decide, you know what, this isn't for me. I, I need to think about other things. I need to make a transition in my life. What, what made you think? What, this? so what I would say the first 15 years of my career there was working for the owners of the company. And working for a family-run business is very different than working in a corporate environment. And that's all I knew. So when the company was sold and went private and became, it was bought by private equity and it just became a much more corporate um, company, um, I was able to live through 10 years of that and really understanding the other side of working for a family-run business and then working for more of a corporate company. 
And after doing that for about 26 years, I felt that that I kind of hit my max. I didn't want to grow anymore there. There was no more challenge for me. And as I continued to be in the market consistently, everybody wants to know the special sauce of off-price. That's what everybody wants to do. What are the margins? What do you have to do? Why is it so different? Why is it profitable? Why is it so much more successful? Why is it growing when department stores are shrinking and specialty stores are going out of business? So I felt that with all my knowledge, I could use it to my advantage and, and consult. It would give me more time to spend at home. So I started consulting, which I enjoyed, but it wasn't as fulfilling as I would like. So I became an adjunct professor at FIT. So I started teaching to, you know, merchandising courses. And I really, really liked that. I had that ability to be home, to live in the market and teach is what I love to do. And then Nordstrom Rack called. And then it's like, that is to me, the pinnacle of retail is the Nordstrom family. So when they called and I interviewed, uh, it was something, you know, you kind of like at the stage of your career, do you want to get back in full time? But because I love this business so much and I saw the challenge ahead as being something I know I could do, I grabbed it. Well, okay, so let's, let's backtrack. You brought up something really good. You talked about the mystery of off-price retailing, and that's kind of what we're here to talk about tonight. What's the difference between off-price and say like the, the Macy's model or the traditional department store model? How does Nordstrom Rack or off-price work differently than tr the traditional Nordstrom store? So the thing about um, off-price is we, we would like to say there's no walls. You have the flexibility to run and chase to what the customer is voting for. And because you're always, you always have money to spend within 30 days, within 60 days, within 90 days, you're able to react to what the, so if the customer's voting for turquoise AirPod cases, you're not already spent all the way out in red and green AirPod cases, you said, oh, they're really reacting to this. I'm going to use my open money and go find that. When you're in a department store, you're kind of placing everything out. You're trying to like use trend direction and ideas on building off of businesses from last year to see what the customer is voting for. But it's too far ahead. So you, you kind of get into the position where sometimes you may get it right and sometimes you may get it wrong. So it's really being... It's in the chase. It's being reactive. It's being quick. It changes all the time. We like to call it the wiggle. You have that flexibility. So it's to me, you can change the trajectory of your business very quickly with your open dollars versus when you're in a department store model. It does, you can't move and groove that quickly. Can, is it, is it, would you say as the leader, um, and we'll get into leadership in just in a while, but would you say as a person who has experienced as a traditional buyer, what would be their learning curve coming into off the world of off, off price? It's actually very, very different. And we like to, when, when I was at Burlington, we used it. It's just like a toolbox. Each buyer has a toolbox, but the tools inside the toolbox are very, very different. And when you're dealing with some department stores, the regular price business is so much more important to the brands that they want to protect that business. It's really, really important. So you're, you're driving business, you're strategizing with your, 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 your vendor suppliers, you're, you're building strategies. And off price, you kind of need to be there when they need you. So are they... Do they need to move inventory? Do they need cash? What, what, are, how, what problem are you solving for the suppliers? So your relationship building is a little bit different. Your reaction time is with more of an urgency when you're dealing in off price and when you're dealing in regular department store. It's just there, there's different ways to move the needle faster in off price. So I have found that at Burlington, there were a lot of people that came in that got really good training from the department store world. But what they learned when they walked in, they're like, wow, I didn't really know how different it was. And it's more about, it's just like this. Whereas department stores, a little bit more steady. It's a little bit, little bit different. So there's a pace, there's a speed, there's different tools that you need in your toolbox. It's, it's definitely different. Can you tell us what an average, I know it's the world of, it's the world of merchandising. I know every day is different, but can you give us an overview in 
the life and day of what it is night night like for Nancy Pekus Mayor. Okay. <laughs> Um, like, you know, how early are you, how early are you at work? Um, what's your day like? Give us an overview of, of what it's like in your world. It's funny when you, when you're in this business, it's not a nine to five job. And what I think, why I think that's okay. My expectation of my team is to not work as much as I do. I work because I'm driven about results, I'm passionate about it, and I have no patience. So because you can change the trajectory of your business pretty quickly, on days I work from home, I'm at my desk at 7 a.m. And the good thing about that is a lot of my team is in Seattle. So from seven to 12, I can do a lot of stuff. From 12 to six, it is like mayhem. I mean, with the amount of people and interacting that you need to talk to and strategizing and how are we going to drive the business or what dollars do we move around because you know water bottles aren't working but calculators are so it's it's the constant like what are we going to do today what does the report card say that the customer is telling us that we have to make a change so we're doing that on a daily basis on days that I'm in New York I'm in the market so if I know that water bottles are slowing down and I have to go buy calculators, I'm going to make appointments with all my vendors that have calculators so I can maximize the calculator business now. Is it going to be good in 90 days? I don't know. I only have to buy right now. I don't have to buy 90, 120 days out. So that's why we need to be in market every week because every week the customer is telling you something different. Or you decide, okay, I want to test these blue AirPod cases. Let's see how she reacts. And then if it's really trend right and it sells really well, then I'm going to want to get it from multiple vendors. I'm going to want to build a strategy and how big I can make it. And I'm going to build it for a period of time. I'm not going to build it for 12 months out. Yeah, I get it. I have two questions for you that uh, a quick question for the group too. Is, so is Nordstrom, is, they, is their corporate and their merchandising and buying, is it decentralized? Do they have buyers and merchants everywhere or is most of it in Seattle? We have two hubs. We have the majority is in Seattle where the company was founded. And we also have a hub in New York City. Okay. And what's it like for you? This, this may be a first for you. I don't know. What's it like for you having a team that's in Seattle and you're in New York? How is leading that different than before? It's different. And I think it has to do a lot with all the conversation about coming back to office, right? Because for years, everyone was working like this on Zoom and you figured out how to make it work. Mm -hmm. But when you're really with your team, a lot of organic things happen. And had I not had that as I was growing in my career, I don't know if I'd be the same merchant as I am today. So I think it's truly, truly important to stand shoulder to shoulder with your team. It's not it's okay to have a head down a couple of days to actually get your work done. But for the majority of the time, it's really important to be with your team. So I do travel there once a month into Seattle. Many of the Seattle team comes here to New York once a month. So I also have, you know, part of my team here that I spend time with. So it's definitely more challenging than all being together at the same time, but it allows us to have different talent in different parts of the country, which is really, really important too. So either way is not 100% effective. So I think this is the best of both worlds. Do you, do you see off price on the West Coast different than off price on the East Coast? Can I ask that question? And in the Midwest, or is it pretty much the same across the regions? For what we sell, it's, it's pretty much similar. Okay. But when you're talking about talent and where the talent is, it's where they could get that, where they can get that education. So Rack has been around since the 70s. So there's a lot of people with a lot of education and off price. It's on the West Coast. Yeah. And then you have a lot of people on the East Coast from places like me, where I'm from Burlington. I have someone on my team from Ross, another person on my team from TJ's. So it's a nice mixture of getting, you know, a different talent from a number of different companies. Absolutely. And I, well, I just know that when I lived in Portland, the Rack stores were just huge. They were just... Mm -hmm just so large because they're so concentrated there. I want to ask you, I want to, I want to jump into this notion of leadership because that's one of your passions. Um, what would you say, let's, 
let's kind of backtrack a little. What would you say um, are some of the things you've learned as a leader? And then also let's talk about what you think makes a really good leader. Because this is really your specialty because you, you are a true leader. So can you give us a few, a few tips? Sure. I would say, you know, God gave us two, and I'm sure everyone's heard this before. God's given you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You should listen twice as much as you speak. And I think as you're becoming a leader, as you get new in role of a leadership role, you have to realize that it's not about you anymore. It's about your team. And it's really about understanding the needs of the team and understanding who is in the right position. Like you're building a team that picture yourself as a coach. You want to have the pitcher who knows how to pitch. You don't want the pitcher at first base. So you have to do a lot more searching about the talents of your team and how to bring out the best in each one of them. So when you're being promoted to as a leader, that is something that is really challenging as a young leader. And you want to, you got to the place because you were good. You were doing all the right things, but it's not about you anymore. It's not about you getting the credit. It's about you sharing the credit and making sure that your team that has earned the credit gets it because the more positivity you give, the more positivity you get. And, you know, I think it's, it's also making sure that whatever vision you have, you're being very, very clear in what you are communicating and that you're getting alignment and buy-in because the last thing you want is someone behind your back is like, I don't believe in what she's doing. So I'm going to do it my way. You want to make sure that not everyone's going to agree with you and that's okay. There's got to be room for debate, room for discussion, rooms for questioning, a safe, you want to make a safe place for your team. Every voice should be heard. And it's usually the quiet one that probably has the, the best idea. So you need to bring out the quiet people too, but you want to make sure that you're, everybody's in alignment because if they're not, your, your vision and your strategy is never going to come through. So all the way of getting new teams, getting new direct reports, having different bosses that would make you crazy because they weren't communicative or clear. You're like, that's not the leader I want to be. So in 30 years with having different leaders and being a different leader and getting the feedback, asking for feedback, giving feedback, all those things, you should have an open mind so you can get better. Other people perceive you a different way and you must be open to that. Yes. I'm learning that every day. I, okay. So I didn't, I've never asked you this question before. What would the leader today, you say to your younger self, if you could say <laughs> give your younger self advice, what would it be? It's not about you. It's not about you. And I think as a buyer, sometimes you get the tendency where the, the spotlight's always on you. The suppliers want to be, you know, they want to build a relationship with you. They, they, they butter you up because they may want, you know, to get something out of you. So you're always on the spotlight. You're always, you know, being treated a certain way. But when you become a leader, it's not about you anymore. And I think that's the hardest thing it's the hardest thing when you're seeing success, you want everyone around you to feel successful. And I think that was the, that was one of my biggest learning curves, which is odd because my first boss that I had, it was never about him. It was always about everybody else. So I don't know. I don't know. I mean, and getting the feedback is definitely very eye opening. And it wasn't because I asked for it, but I was told, and you should always be asking for it. No one should have to tell you things like that. You should be saying, what am I doing well? What could I be doing better? I'm open to listening. That's fantastic. So we've been, we've been yapping for 30 minutes. So I want to open it up to questions, but I want to, I want to, I want to end on a personal note with you. Um, you are really someone I've, I've bonded with who believes in walking the talk and you've always been a champion of what's now called diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, it's truly a, an, a, an extension of you as a person. So how does this reflect in your life? Would you like to share that with us and, and give it? Yeah, I think what I am so thrilled about is also finding, that was one of the other things about Nordstrom, not only being the pinnacle of retail, but they really talk the talk too. So their values very much align with mine. And we have committed to the 15% pledge, which, you know, in a period of time, you know, we, we do have a timeline to get there. 
because we think it's important because it it is it it's it's how the country looks and we want to make sure that we don't live in a glass bubble either in Seattle or in New York the world is out there and i think it's really important to just be opening to open to new ideas and once a week we have a discussion on our team about we don't call DIB anymore we call DEIB and it's really important that we create a safe space. We do this on Zoom or Teams or whatever. And we talk about how are you feeling? Give us an example of how what you did. Is it, did you volunteer? Did you did 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 something happen to you? Did you witness something? To make sure we create a safe space for all. And honestly, I feel so encouraged by the team feeling extremely vulnerable and open and wanting to share. And I think. That to me, and I could walk out of that office every day and feel like, okay, we are making a difference together. Yeah. And that's really, really important. What is DEIB? I, what does the B stand for? Belonging. That's fantastic. I actually like that. I like that a yeah. lot. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to open it up to questions. Does anyone have a question for Nancy? So I, I thought Nancy would get a lot of questions. That's why I kind of want to open it up. Any questions at all? Silence. I have one. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so you are talking earlier about how um, off price, you kind of have a little more flexibility in like your buying dollars. Um, and then you mentioned like the one example, like if calculators are selling better, you said you would make like an appointment with all your calculator vendors. Um, so then when you're, if you're in a situation like that, how does that work? Are you making appointments and then like going to each one and then coming back to purchase? Or are you buying like calculators with each vendor? Calculators in the moment. Because okay. the one thing what you would normally see is if calculators are working for you, they're working for everybody. When skinny okay. jeans were hot, everybody had to have skinny jeans. Now wider legs are working and boot cuts. Everybody's okay. wanting that. Everybody, it, it's amazing that the trends are continuous throughout the market. So if it's a great calculator and it's a great deal and it's a great brand, yeah, you want to commit to it right there. If you're like, I don't know, I think I'm not sure about this. Let me go competitive shop. Let me see how many calculators are out there, what the different price points are. Maybe you'll hold back. Not every deal is right. But if there is a deal that you want to have, you're definitely go um, for it. Go for it. Mm -hmm. That's how it is with me. Every company is different. You know, there's different, you know, there's different processes. Danielle, Thank you. Sorry, Bria. Danielle, did you have a question? Yeah, I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> well, first off, I started um, my career at Burlington also as an assistant buyer. And I just remember you being so poised and articulate whenever I would pass you in the hall or be like maybe um, in market or in the New York office on Broadway um, at the same time. So it's very surreal to hear <laughs> all of your wisdom now that you're no longer there um, and nor am I. My question is, um, have you, you kind of touched on this when you switched from consulting back to corporate. Um, I've been buying for eight years now at three different companies and I'm about to become a manager for the first time. Um, Congratulations. Yeah. And my question is, um, like at what point do you realize you're not really buying anymore and you're training buyers and lifting up your team? And do you ever miss buying? Those are really, really good questions. And I'll give you a personal example because when I became, when Tom Kingsbury promoted me to SVP in footwear, we were sitting at a vendor's table and I'm yeah, like, when you're a buyer, you got to touch, you got to feel, you got to, you got to know the quality of something to know how to value it. And I picked it up and I'm turning it around and I'm, you know, like how many you have of these? And he pulled me aside because this is what feedback in the moment is so important. He pulled me aside after work, you know, after we walked out of the meeting, he's like, that's not your role anymore. I mean, just those words to me, it's like, wow. I guess that's not my, now I have to understand the leader that I want to be. And 
is that the right deal? It's more about how do you coach your team? Are they asking the right questions? You know, what are, what are the things that they need to work on? Every appointment you kind of walk out of, you're like, okay, how, did they, how do you think it went? And ask a lot of questions, definitely probe your team. But um, I would say, yes, it's hard to give up buying. I love product. Um, but there's a time that if you want to, grow, there are buyers that just buy for the rest of their lives and that's okay too. It's really what you want to do in your career. But I would say, you know, being a new manager of a person is definitely a challenge. And just remember, they want to be you someday. So how do you get them to be you? Because one day you're going to be gone, whether you're going to be promoted or you're going to leave. And your legacy is making sure that someone is given the right tools to be successful in your role. Thank you. I needed to hear that. I appreciate it. You're welcome. It. No problem. I have a question. Go ahead, Wendy. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm actually in a Burlington Co-Factory alum, I guess, too. I oh, work here. Um, I started in vendor relations and then went into procurement and then I left and started working for Drexel. So now I work for Drexel and I go to school here. But, um, and I remember you there. So <laughs> um, um, I wanted to ask like for your team, like who, like, like on your, when you look at your whole team, like who are your superstars and like, like what are the three like top qualities you would say make them like very, I guess, like assets to your, your, what you do? That's an excellent question too. When I think about who my superstars are, I think it's really, really important about communication, alignment, and follow-up. Because again, it's kind of like making sure that your vision is going to come to life and you get the buy-in and you get the alignment and then you get the actual execution of it. If that piece is missing, that the alignment's not there, you know, we would call it VAE, vision alignment execution. They mm -hmm. all have to be there. So if there's someone that's kind of a missing link there, then you have to kind of nip that in the bud and have that conversation. And, and it's not like, because then, then you're the rest of your team kind of sees, okay, well, she's not enforcing that person to do what's needed to be done. Right. And I don't really have to. So your team sees each other, we ha you have to make sure that everyone is marching to the same, in the same direction. It's mm -hmm. really, really important. And then they communicate, you know, it's more about how are they keeping you up to date, asking for feedback. And those things are, I, I would, I would probably stop it there. Okay. Thank you. Hope that's helpful. <laughs> it is. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Maddie. Hi, how are you? Um, I had a question about um, planning. So I know that you were interested in science and math at the time, um, but what you kept going through the pattern, sorry, the, the career path of buying. And um, so I was just curious why you didn't really, were not interested in merchandising or planning sides of the, you know, those sectors. That's another really good, these are amazing questions. So the funny thing Thank is, you. and I didn't, I didn't talk about this at the beginning, but when I first started buying, we, ha we didn't have planning. Planning didn't really exist. So we were our own allocators. We were our, our own planners. So we built our own plans. They didn't, they didn't match up to anything. They didn't add up to anything. It was just basically a suggestion. <laughs> Way back when, I'm talking way back when, when we were very, very scrappy and writing everything in pencil and Excel had just come out. But what I would say to that is the planning part was really, really great too, because that would allow you to say, okay, do I need to turn faster? How do I move my receipts around? Where's the opportunity in what kind of category I can drive sales in? If I drive category sales here, it has to come out from somewhere else. So it was, it was like putting puzzles in a, you know, putting a puzzle together. So honestly, I really do like the planning aspect of it. I just think that I, I would miss being in the market, the negotiating, the building the relationship part of the business was really, really good for me also. So when you kind of have both feet in the business, 
you're very influential in the plans because you're out there seeing the product. So you know what's going to be good based on how, what you're talking, the market trend forecasting and stuff. So you have influence over the planning, but the actual execution of the plans was not as interesting to me as marrying both the merchandising, the product piece, as well as the, the and the strategy, I guess you would say. Great, thank you so much for your advice. Planning's a great, uh, it, planning is an, a fabulous career path as well. And when I say that I have influence on the planning side, the planners have mm -hmm. influence on the buying side too. So there's definitely a really good collaboration between planning and buying. It's kind of like, what do you lean more towards? Absolutely, I agree, thank you. Go ahead, Betty. Okay, hi. Um, hi. Hi, I, I work in uh, site, site work and in retail leasing. And as, as a matter of fact, I was just over at Burlington today. There was an ICSC meeting. That's just <laughs> a little aside since there's so many Burlington um, connections here today. Um, I was just wondering, um, where do you see off price uh, retailing uh, growth versus full price retailing, you know, in terms of percentages? Just curious, you know, where you see the trend trend going. Yeah, I think all the trends are basically saying when you look at where all the store openings are happening, they're happening mm -hmm. in off price. Okay. And the reason that is, I guess you would say, one of the reasons is, you know, customers like convenience, you know, you can open an off-price retailer in a mall. You don't really see them opening much in malls anymore. They're in strip centers. They're in places that are much more convenient. Maybe they're near a grocery store. So you're running in to get your milk and you're like, oh, let me see what's new there. So it, it's almost like shopping as a sport. When you're looking, when you're going into a Macy's or something, you're going in there for a purpose. You know, I have an event to go to. I need earrings. I have an event to go. You know, you're not really walking around the the you know, Macy's and like, hmm, what am I going to buy today? I think those days of shopping happened in the 80s and the 90s. I don't know if they're happening much now. So it has to be shopping as a sport to me. It has to be, you know, Nordstrom has a lot of amazing events. They have a lot of creativity, a lot of pop-ups, a lot of reasons to come to Nordstrom because there's so many great things that do happen at Nordstrom. Plus we have a great restaurant in every store really, really good. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a reason to go to a store like that. And that's why I think Nordstrom is so exciting because it, it is different. It's a lot of trend. It's a lot of great brands. When I look at some of the other department stores, I don't know if they're staying as up to date or, you know, as exciting as off prices, because you're going to go in there and you're like, I don't even know, maybe I need a pillow, but I'm walking out with tea bags i don't know like you just never know what you're gonna find and right. it's like yeah you know yeah yeah okay. so i do believe it there's you know if you listen to ross and burlington and marmax they're all growing stores there's all room for thousands of stores and off price and when we look at nordstrom rack we opened up two this month we have five opening this in may and we have the ability to open more stores too so I think it's it's definitely going to continue to grow for the foreseeable future. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Welcome. Go ahead, Wendy. Hi again. Hi. <laughs> I wanted to know, like, like negotiating, like what, do you have any tips on doing that? Like, I hate doing that like I hate feeling like I'm bartering like I, yeah. I went out of the country recently and it was like yeah you have to bar I was like no can it just be a decent price and like I like do you have any tips on that like because I know like some people like are maybe a little apprehensive about becoming a buyer because they feel like they might you know kind of get suckered <laughs> yeah <laughs> get something that they shouldn't yeah I think that's a good question too I would say when it comes to negotiation, every situation is different. Mm -hmm. And it's not just what is needed in the moment for that particular deal. It's what is the long-term, you know, sometimes you have to give a little to get what you want. 
So I would say that you can't just say, I need it at this price and that's it. Mm -hmm. How is the relationship? What's the long-term benefits? Is it a brand you really want? So, and, and what can you offer them? How are you solving their problems? So I think it's really, it's not just negotiating and that's tough. It's, it's about, you know what, the price out there for red sweaters are, is $20. You can go into Macy, you can go anywhere. Why should I have to be $25, right? So it's knowing your being a student of your business, really knowing what value should be is really, really important. And knowing what's important to the person across the table. And it's really also important to not be so chatty. You know, it's okay to have times when you're just staring across the table because you're, you're saying something and in, and, and in silence, people feel very comfortable. They're like, oh, okay, I'll just give it to you. So there's a lot of different tips, which is a whole other um, meeting, <laughs> yes. meeting on. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I would say I came into this business as an introvert. I'm still an introvert, but I do what needs to be done for the business. Okay. So, yeah, I'm an introvert too. So I'm just yeah, like, and that's okay. <laughs> like you just slide a piece of paper across the table. Yeah. We have to have a conversation. Like, sorry, <laughs> thank you though. <laughs> when you get that deal and it sells like you wanted to, you're like, it's it's you get the juice. It's it's good. It's oh, good. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Maddie. Hi. Yes. One more question I came up with. Um, it has to do actually with Nordstrom's. Um, you know, I've seen online when I purchase items on Nordstrom's, um, I actually get a Nordstrom's rack box and it's like an item that was on sale. Um, it, you know, so I was just kind of curious, what is your relationship with buying items that are on the Nordstrom end and then bringing it to Nordstrom Rack? Do you get a discount or is it just a partnership where you just end up getting the product that does not, um, is old season or whatever, and then just needs to be out of the Nordstrom and goes to Nordstrom Rack automatically? The reason, you know, we, we have a synergy between the two companies and the way, the reason for being for Nordstrom Rack is to, it was in the seventies to be there when Nordstrom couldn't sell the product. So it was important mm -hmm. that we were in existence for anything that really wasn't working in Rack. So they, in Nordstrom, so they could have the best of the best, you know, they were, they had the customer coming in, they wanted to see the freshest, the best. So Nordstrom Rack was really built for an exhaust to, for Nordstrom to move on to new goods. Now, with yes. that being said, we have very much cross shopping. So our customer that, you know, many times how a customer moves on to Nordstrom could happen through Nordstrom Rack. So there's definitely synergies mm -hmm. of our customers between the two. So there are times when we may get their inventory and there are times when, you know, the goods may be coming out of the same DC, you know, there's very different, um, okay. There's different, definitely different reasons for it all, but for the most part, the majority of our goods that we buy are bought at, from Rack specifically, but we do have synergies. Okay. Our strategy is closer to you. So a customer could get something online from Nordstrom, go into Nordstrom Rack, return it, buy something at Nordstrom Rack, bring it back to Nordstrom. So we make it very easy. It's all about pleasing the customer and service and making it easy for them to shop and to get things done. So it's really important that we do create those synergies between the two companies. So you have cross returns, like someone can return mm -hmm. at the other division, even if they mm -hmm. didn't buy it there. That's wonderful. Yep. Yep. I have a question Thank for you, you about You're products. Welcome. Do you see mm -hmm. with off price, do you see the rise of home being just as important as apparel? Do you see accessory, tech accessories like is there, has there been a shift since, you know, since your, since your days of starting in the business to now that there's an equilibrium that's changing in lifestyle product categories? It's just not all about clothes anymore. Yeah, I think it's really good to be able to test and try new things. And that's what's so good about off price, because if you're not a home business or you don't have a big home business, but that's where the that's where the industry is going. You're going to want to get into that. And that's what's really good about off price. You have that flexibility to try different things. Now, why people come to Nordstrom Rack is because of, we just have great brands and there's not a ton of brands in the home space. So 
I do think there are other retailers that do it in a really good way, but people don't really come to us for home business. We have great home stuff, but it's more like, oh my God, I didn't know they had this. And it's not like they're coming, like they'll go to, people will go to home goods because I need new pillows. I need new this. I need sheets and whatever. There, that's a destination. I think it's a aha and a surprise and delight when you come into a Nordstrom rack. I have another question, Nancy. Um, as you've grown in your career and took on more responsibilities and more strategy, um, more initiatives, what would you say is like the percentage of yourself? And your personality that you bring to the office and has that percentage changed as you've become more of an executive? That's a really good question. I'd have to actually think about it. I like to think, and I, and I do think that this is one of the most, the comments that I get about me all the time is that I'm just authentic. I'm, I am who I am pretty much in every situation. Are there times when you need to be more mature, more you know, corporate in different, in different settings. Yes. But I just think that, as I said, I'm an introvert and I have to be, you know, I have to do a lot of speeches and I have to do a lot of presentations. That's not in my comfort zone, but I'm still going to be who I am when I do it. So I don't think, unless you're an actor that you need, I don't believe you need to change. I believe you should be the same in and out because that's your authentic self. You should owe it. And that's why DEIB is so important because for so many years, people of different races, religions, everything had to come to work and not be who they were. Being at Nordstrom, you're able to be who you want to be, who you are. And that to me is so important because you should always bring your authentic self to work. You may not, may not be in your comfort zone to do certain things as you grow as a leader, standing up in front of people, making presentations. That's not something that's in my comfort zone, but I do it because it's part of the job. Um, not because I like to do it, but I, I, I do it be, and I, I'm starting to enjoy it. I'm getting better at it every day. It's not my, it's not what I do best. <laughs> if that's helpful. Yeah. No, it is. Um, I actually, I had a conversation recently where a leader said that they feel they can only bring like 60% of themselves to work. Mm. And I was just shocked. I thought you're a leader. You should be bringing like 120% of yourself. Um, mm -hmm. if you expect your team to give their full selves. So I was just curious if you felt like similarly. It may not be the company for you then. If that, if you can't be who you are, then maybe it's not the company for you within reason. I mean, you can't show up in sweats every day because you're an active, you're an athlete, but you know what I'm saying? Like you should never, you should always be able to be authentic. Thank you. I think it's hard for people that come from the eighties, nineties world of retailing where they couldn't be themselves at work to now turn the switch on at times. So I think yep. it depends on the generation. That's true too. And they're trying to just, they're, they're, they're trying to go, they love the fact that you can bring yourself now, but it, they were just enculturated to know that they had to hide mm -hmm. in order to get ahead. But now they're, you know, for years, women didn't talk about having children. They mm -hmm. just, you could not talk about having kids. So I think it, I think it's changing a lot. And I think that that's, what's wonderful about everything. I think it's changing. And I think it's just, you know, at least at Nordstrom, it's not acceptable any other way. You know, if you can't talk about your children because it's a man only environment, that just, that wouldn't fly. Like maybe it would fly elsewhere. There's a lot of, you know, boys clubs in other companies, depending on the type of industry. But I'm so thankful that I get to work for a company where it's not like that. It's a safe space. It's very important to have, um, what do I call it? Um, Oh my God, the, the term is escaping me, but you're, you're, you're able to just be you and it's, it's very accepted and that any company should be. And if it isn't, it may not be for you. Fantastic. Any other questions? Nancy? These are all great I, questions. You have questions. <laughs> Nicole, go, Nicole, go. 
Hi, how are you? Um, Nancy, I had a quick question for you, and especially now that you're in the Nordstrom space where it's Nordstrom and not, not verse rack, Nordstrom and rack. Are you mm -hmm. seeing in general between off price and full price, a trade down customer and, you know, really a shift in the customer now that times are a little bit tougher, you know, every groceries are more expensive. Gas is more expensive. Like how is that affecting, you know, really the off price versus the full price customer? I think the industry would say that in recessionary times and as things get more and more expensive, I think I think that's that's happening across the board. Is it happening specifically in Nordstrom and Nordstrom Rack? I can't be specific there, but more and more people are where value and price is super, super important. And, you know, it's a struggle out there. It really is. So you know, maybe it's not necessarily a trade down, but maybe they don't need that extra pair of shoes, you know? So I think I think this this time that's going on in the world today, and that's why off price is so good and Walmart's doing so well and Target's doing so well because they're delivering value and they sell lots of things that you may need, but they also sell things that you really don't need, but the values are really strong, you know? So. I think value in itself is becoming super, super important across both full line and off price. Any other questions? Silence. No? Well, there's a lot of great questions. It, these have been fantastic questions. Nancy, it has been a pleasure. Do you have questions for us before you go? <laughs> no, I, I just I, I'm very pleased with the questions that you guys have asked. I think they're very intuitive. And honestly, one of the things that I would just recommend, and not that I'm suggesting this for me, but take a mentor. If you guys want to reach out to me and ask me a question, getting to where I am, I didn't do it on my own. And I had a lot of people along the way that don't, they don't just come up to you and say, hey, I'm going to help you. You have to ask for it. And that's, and, and everybody wants to help. Everybody wants to help. So don't be shy, ask for help. I see another question. Don't be shy, ask for help and grab a mentor because you need someone to help you. You can't do it on your own. And bosses come and go. Mentors are the one that really do kind of stay with you. Yes, they do. Chris, go ahead. Go for it, Chris. <laughs> Sorry, you can tell I'm I'm like a slow processor. It takes me a while. Sorry. This was this was really great. This was so great. And Nancy, I've heard a ton of things about you from from Joe. So it's so nice to to hear and see you in this space. I'm really curious about um, how is off price um, embracing um, sustainability and eth ethical fashion and. <clears throat> How are they doing it now? And where do you like where do you see the future um, in that? I you know, you know, the system is we're all having issues. I think the whole mm -hmm. system's having issues, but um, I think uh, within uh, your arena and off price, there I think there's huge opportunities just because of uh, you know, the buying power. Um, to mm -hmm. be able to really um, push this initiative. Um, and I'm just curious what, what, what's happening and what initiatives are going on. Well, one of the things I think is good for sustainability, it may not be the product itself, itself but being able to take on product versus it going to you know, a landfill or something. So I think that's the benefit of being an off price. Now, when you're talking about things that you're cutting up and trying to get cheap, there's a whole other situation to be very, very, um, it's really important to know where those goods are coming from. How long, you know, is it sustainable? Is it, is it, you know, we have very strict rules in Nordstrom where things you can buy, where things that can be produced. So I think when it comes to, are we, are, are there people being taken care of when it comes to how people are treated and, you know, you know, manufacturers are treated, that's really, really important. We do have a sustainability goal that is on our website. I think it's getting to a percentage by a certain period of time, but I don't believe it's been as big of a focus as it needs to be for, for RAC. So we try to find more resources that do have better sustainability practices or you know, practices that, that you know where the fibers are coming from, like the whole you know, chain of 
it's it's it needs to be more top of mind. I know that the, the fashion industry is not, it's not a good answer. I don't really have a good answer, but I don't really have a strategy yet. But I do believe that it's something we have to be more on top of. But Nordstrom as a whole, it's really important to make sure that we do our part as much as we can. Great question. Okay. Great question. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, what's the best way to stay in touch with you? Like LinkedIn or just you maybe can definitely, on the train yeah. and heading to market? <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely reach me via LinkedIn. And Joe, if you want to give my, you know, I can give you my personal email. Um, Joe has my personal email. It's definitely, you're definitely welcome to have it. I, I meet people for coffee. I have n I, I, this, this, this is a true passion of mine and I want people to be successful. It's really, really important. I call Nancy my retail spirit as she is the person that I would have wanted to be if I would have stayed in retailing. She would, she's my retail mentor spirit. And Thanks, the, way, Joe. the way you lead is fantastic. And again, we met by, we met by accident. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a great, it's been a great connection and we've networked and we both share this one thing in common. We're both up at the crack of dawn. Yes, 5 a.m. We're, te we're texting each other. <laughs> but it's been, a, it's been a great pleasure, Nancy. And um, again, if anyone wants Nancy's contact information, I'm happy to share it. And we appreciate your hour of, you know, out of your busy, busy day. Because I know you're going to be up again at five o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> getting the train again. And So will you. <laughs> thank, thank you thank all. You. This was great. Thank you so much. Thank you.